Good morning. Welcome to worship. I want to thank the Caroline Ringers for the beautiful prelude this morning, and thank you for being here today to join us for worship. We're glad that you're here. We, uh, if you're a guest of our church, we welcome you. I'm Clayton Oliphant, pastor of the church. We welcome all of our guests. We want you to know we're so pleased that you've chosen to be with us this morning. And from wherever you are, we we're glad that you've chosen to be here today. Want to encourage everyone, members and guests, to sign in this morning. The registration pads are on the end of each pew. Let me encourage you to pass those along so that everyone has a chance to sign in. Where are my Red Raider fans at this morning? Okay. I knew you'd say something if I didn't say something, so. <laughs> so congratulations, Final Four. Texas Tech's going to the Final Four in basketball. That's, that's amazing, that's great. Everybody, I mean, everybody in Texas ought to be rooting for Texas Tech at this point, right? Amen, you know, that's, that's the way it ought to work, in my opinion, anyway. We're glad you're here again and want to tell you about a couple of things going on in the life of our church. Um, one of those is our garden ministry, and there's an insert in your bulletin that tells you a little bit about our garden ministry and has some, uh, an order form here. You want to order flowers from our garden ministry. You know, the garden ministry is, is an amazing ministry. They provided over 1,500 pounds of produce for the network of community ministries last year. And so it's not only, you know, something that, that beautifies our campus, it's uh, blessing our community with, um, with what they're, they're able to produce. So it's, it's a great ministry, and we'd love for you to learn more about it. Also on the back of the bulletin, there's lots of different offerings. I want to just highlight some of our Holy Week services that are coming up and get, get you to get those on your calendar. There's a, a program on Tuesday night of Holy Week, and then uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday services, a baptism service on Saturday, and then our Easter services. Hope that you'll mark your calendars and be aware of those uh, very special services that just bless us at this time of year. want to also uh, just remind you of our mission as a church. We're here to welcome people for Christ, to grow people in Christ, and to serve people with Christ. That's why we're here, and I hope that's why you're here today, to be a part of that mission. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand as we sing our praise to God.
seated. As you're being seated, we want to invite the Coleman family forward as they present their uh, daughter for baptism. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs to life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Barrett and Cheryl, on behalf of the church, I want to ask you these questions. And I'll also invite those who are standing in support of you today to also respond to these questions. Do you, in presenting your daughter for holy baptism, confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before this child a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care that she be brought up in the Christian faith, that she be taught the holy scriptures, and that she learn the joy of worshiping God? Will you endeavor to keep this child under the ministry and guidance of the church until she, by the power of God, shall accept for herself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church? What name is given this child? Brooke Parker, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Brooke. Can I show you off to my friends in the choir here? This is Brooke. Oh, we lost a shoe someplace. Okay. <laughs> She's a barefoot girl. Here we go. This little piggy went to market. I remember those days. Hey, I want to introduce you to your family because all these people are part of your family, Brooke. And when you grow up, people are going to say a lot of things. They'll, they'll, they'll talk about you and, and try to identify you. What we want to tell you today is in your baptism, you have an identity as a child of God. And that's the foremost, most important identity of your life. If you ever forget that, these people right here in the church, those people right down there, and especially these people right here, they're going to tell you who you are, remind you that you're a beloved child of God, that God loves you now and forevermore. Let's come down for the family blessing. We're going to reach out our hands toward Brooke. Everybody reach up. And here we go. Here we go. All right. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and the Spirit, you may ever be a true and faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a gift from our children's ministry right here for you. And we have a congregational pledge that we like to say to people who are baptized at any age. And this congregational pledge is our way of saying when you're baptized, you're not just baptized and that's the end of the story. You're baptized into a community of faith. And when you're baptized into that community of faith, that community of faith says we're here to help the baptized among us to live into these, these words that we talk about and to experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ. So congregation, we're gonna say these words and I always say, let's back them up with action. Let's be the church God has called us to be. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Brooke Parker, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened 
and the way that leads to life eternal. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer in the service this morning, let me remind you there are names on the screens of people who uh, are in need of our prayers, uh, joys, and concerns. There are also prayer blankets on both sides of the sanctuary and in the back this morning. So please take time to come and say a prayer, tie a knot in the fringe, and those blankets will be taken to persons so that they know that they are wrapped in the prayers of this congregation. And now, let us pray together. In my reading this week, I found a prayer that I want to share with you this morning as a part of my pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Lord, when I'm famished, give me someone who needs food. When I am thirsty, send me someone who needs water. When I am cold, 
send me someone to warm. When I am hurting, send me someone to console. When I'm poor, lead me someone needy to me. When I have no time, give me someone to help for just a moment. When I am criticized, give me someone to praise. When I am discouraged, send me someone to encourage. When I need another's understanding, give me someone who needs mine. When I need someone to take care of me, send me somebody to care for. When I think too much of myself, turn my thoughts towards someone else. Oh God, we lift up to you this morning those in our world who are displaced, lost or confused, those wandering for whatever reason. Comfort those in our congregation who need you in special ways right now in their lives, whether because of illness, a diagnosis, loss of a loved one, whatever change is happening in their lives. And God, this morning we also celebrate with those who are experiencing joys. Sometimes we concentrate on the, the things that are wrong. Everyone experiences some joys, and we thank you for that blessing. God, in these uncertain times, you are our certainty. You are the rock upon which we grasp for stability. We wonder at the lack of trust, respect, and compassion that we see around us and hear on the news daily. We pray that you will give us openness to be respectful, compassionate, and loving. Open us to your fullness. Let your loving spirit fill us and consume us with the fire that radiates out to all we see and come in contact with so that we can help make our community in this world a better place. It is in the name of your son, the Christ, that we pray as he taught his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now the ushers come forward for our offerings. And remember that you can also um, pay online or through your phone, your devices.
As you're being seated, I invite all of the children here with us today to come to the steps and let us share children's time together. Won't you come? Okay, I have a question for you. This movie's a little older, but I think maybe some of you have seen it. Have you ever seen the original Toy Story movie? Has anybody seen that? Yes, some of you? Okay, so, um, so there's a boy named Andy, and he has a lot of toys. Yeah, we have a clock. It's awesome. I see it. I see it. So... Andy has a lot of toys, and how do those toys know they belong to Andy? Does anybody know? He has written his name on the bottom of their feet. So Woody, is Sheriff Woody is one of his favorites, and it says Andy on the bottom of Sheriff Andy's, I mean Sheriff Woody's foot. And a new toy comes along named Buzz Lightyear. Buzz Lightyear's fancy. He's an astronaut on a mission. And at first, they aren't sure about Buzz because they don't feel like he really belongs. But guess what Andy puts on the bottom of Buzz's foot? Andy. And all of the toys know that they all belong to Andy. And they all know who loves them? Andy. And if they ever get lost, who do they try to get back to? Andy. Do you know... It's kind of that way with God and us. Now, God didn't write God on the bottom of your foot with a Sharpie, right? But it's written in you. It's written in you that you belong to God and that God loves you. So when the toys all go on their different adventures, sometimes they end up at like Pizza Planet. When they end up there, they know they need to get back to Andy. And sometimes we get out into the world and we go on adventures or we get separated from God. And who do we try to get back to? God. We do try to get back to God. We've talked a lot about feet this sermon series. I talked talk to you about taking your feet off and standing in the gr- on the ground. Talked to you about taking your shoes off. And so you stand and you walk on holy ground. And everywhere you go, you, who goes with you? God. So I want you to think of this. There may be people sometime in your life who try to tell you who you are, but you always know that you're God's. Always know that you're God's. God has written it on you, and God has claimed you. So we get to be God's people. Okay, y'all ready to say a prayer? Let's say a prayer. I'll say a little bit, and you repeat after me. You ready? Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for being with us for writing on us that we are yours wherever we go, forever and ever. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, y'all have a great day. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah in the 43rd chapter, verses 1 through 7. May we be engulfed by God's love as we listen now for the word of God. But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, 
Ethiopia and Sabah in exchange for you because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, Texas Tech won that game last night, and who did they play? Gonzaga. Now next year, we have a young man from this church that's playing for Gonzaga. That's my new favorite team. <laughs> so Drew, that's for you. Next year, I'm picking the Zags to win it all. Tell, I'm calling it now, calling my shot now. A year ahead of time. That's my tournament team next year. We've been talking about um, the, uh, the greatest story. We've been talking about how the, the unfolding story of the scriptures tell us about this greatest story of, of who God is and, and what God is doing in our lives. And we've been talking about, um, we started with creation and, and these great sweeping themes that go throughout the scriptures, creation, that God created us. We were made in the image of God. You and I created in the image of a loving God. And we talked about covenant and how God is, is, has made a covenant to be our God, that God is not going to be unfaithful to that covenant. Even though we turn away, God will not turn away from us. God will be faithful to that covenant. God is our covenant God. And then we talked about slavery and, and, um, and liberation. Last week we talked about how God uh, took the people, out, the Israelite people, out of, out of slavery in Egypt and made them uh, a way through a miraculous um, salvation, of li liberating them so they could move toward the promised land. Now in the promised land the people uh, began to set up uh, first judges over them and then kings and sometimes they would be faithful to God and sometimes they would not be faithful to God and as the years went through there was this up and down cycle of faithfulness and unfaithfulness and uh, then God sent prophets to them to try to encourage them to be faithful warning them that if they were not faithful bad things would happen and sure enough um, twice in the history of the, the northern and southern kingdom of, of Israel and Judah, uh, they, they had these outside forces, uh, massive armies that came in and swept in upon them and conquered them. And, and it happened in, in around the 720s and it happened again in the, seven, in the 580s where uh, the, northern, the northern kingdom of Israel and then later the, the southern kingdom, kingdom of Judah were uh, destroyed and, and these kingdoms, the Assyrian army the first time, the Babylonian army the second time comes in and, and sweeps in upon them and destroys their cities and takes, many people were killed and, and those who were not killed, people were taken away into exile. They were into forced labor in other countries. They were the conquered. And so their, their lives, can you imagine their lives. I mean, just imagine, if you will, that everything you know, everything you have believed in, everything you've stood for, that everything is taken away from you. Imagine what it would be like to have your homeland destroyed and then to be taken out of your homeland into a foreign land and made to, to live there and to work there and to, to serve there. And can you imagine the upheaval and the disorientation that you would experience in this? So much of the Bible was written from this perspective, from the time of the exile. Because there in the exile, 
people in this, in this season of dis disruption and disorientation in their lives. They found that their lives were, were, were totally turned upside down in such a way that they were asking questions like, where is God? And why do bad things happen to good people? And how can we worship God when we're living in a foreign land? How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Words of disruption and disorientation. And so much of the Bible is, is written in this period because the people in exile began to say, well, all these stories we have, we have learned through oral tradition, we must write these stories down for our children, for our grandchildren, for those who will come after us. We must write down these stories and write these words upon their hearts so that they can remember, that they will know who they are and their heritage. But see, all that heritage was, was in upheaval. All that life was, was totally disoriented. And, and maybe you can understand that. Maybe you've been through seasons of exile in your own life. Maybe you've had those, those periods in your own life where, where you could identify with what they were feeling in those seasons of exile. Have you ever been in a, a place where you lost a job and, and you, one day you're working and you, you have placed value and meaning and, and part of your identity in that job and then the next day that job is taken away and you are wondering then who am I now when I place so much stock in, in my identity as working here and now that's gone, who am I now that that's no longer the case? You ever been in a situation where you've, you've uh, lost a loved one and you, you go through that, that season of disorientation called grief in which you're struggling to try to find your balance and your equilibrium and try to figure out who am I now that this has happened in my life? Where do I go? Where do I turn? Everything I have known has now been disrupted. And, and the, the sense of disorientation that you feel in grief is so real. You don't know in that, in that grief. You don't know how, how do I get through this? And where is God? And why did God abandon me? The times that you feel that when you're grieving the loss of a loved one. People who have been through the divorce, you know, walk through that season of, of disorientation and, and feel like they're wearing a scarlet letter D on their, on their shoulder, you know, that, that people must look at them different because they're now divorced. And, and they go through that season of disruption and disorientation trying to figure out how do I pick up the pieces of my life and where do I go from here? And that sense of disorientation when once you were a couple and now you're single, you, you're trying to figure out, how do I do this? Addiction can be a season of disorientation. Those who suffered addiction to, to alcohol or drugs, the opioid crisis that our nation faces right now, you know that when you are at, have an addiction to, there's a chemical reaction in your brain that, that changes your perception and you talk about disorientation, you, you, you're not thinking clearly. Even though you think you're thinking clearly, you're not thinking clearly. You're not making the best decisions for yourself and therefore you, you find your life spiraling sometimes and you wonder, how did I get here? How did I get to this place? And now that I'm in this place, is there any hope, is there any help how do I go forward from here? Disorientation is a part of life. Therefore, we can relate to those in exile because we know what that's like in one sense or another. We've all been through those seasons of change in our lives. Every change in your life brings about an identity crisis where you're asking, now that this has happened, who am I now? 
And because change is a constant, there's a sense in which a lot of us are constantly going through this identity crisis. We're, we're trying to figure out who are we and why are we here and what's our purpose and how do we get back to a sense of normal? How do we get back home? I think that's the question when you're, when you're in exile, how do I get home? And will things ever be home and normal or will there be a new normal that will come out of this season of disruption and disorientation? So I think into this situation, God speaks to those in exile and God gives a word of faithfulness in the midst of this exile. God sends prophets and, and the prophets were very helpful. You know, the prophets warned the people about what would happen and then after the bad things happened that they warned the people about, then they would say, told you so. Helpful, right? You always love those friends that I told you. That's so helpful. But then they would come back with a word of hope and and the prophet speaking for God would be messengers of hope in the midst of really terrible circumstances, severe circumstances. Here's, here's this, this prophet Isaiah speaking a word of the Lord to the people in exile. And, and the, first, the first thing that, that Isaiah tells them is who they are. It's about their identity. You belong to God. God has not left you. You still are God's people. And that's something they needed to know and something they needed to hear. When, the, when you're in exile and you don't know who you are, you need to hear you, you belong to God. I love it the way he, he says it here. Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are mine. You are precious in my eyes. You are honored. I love you. I give people in exchange for you. You're valuable to me. Here's God speaking a word to them about their identity, that they are children of God. They belong to God. It, knowing who you are is, is, is so important, and knowing whose you are is even more important. I've told the story. Some of you have heard me tell the story about my growing up years and, and that my my family had this code word we would say when we were leaving, departing from each other. My, my mother would always say, remember the Alamo. Strange thing to say to your children when they're leaving home. But it was kind of the family code word. Her mother had said it to her. She said it to us. We've said it to our kids. Every time we depart from each other, especially if you're, you're going out or something, you know, remember who you are. Remember the Alamo. That's what that was about. Remember who you are. Remember the Alamo was the code word for our family to behave yourself and remember that you're part of a family and remember who you are, that you're loved. You have a place in this family. So I remember in high school, I, my friend Casey had a Cutlass Supreme all jacked up, you know, these bald tires on the back because he peeled out so much. And, and we would, I, I remember leaving the house, he honked and he was there. And, Four of my buddies are in the car, and I go and climb in the back seat of that, of that cutlass, and we're going to go out and have fun that night. And my mother follows me out to the car and knocks on the window. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, Casey rolls down the window, and, and my, my mother says, Clayty, remember the Alamo? And my friends look at me and just go, <laughs> oh, my gosh, what is that? Mother, please, don't embarrass your child like that, you know. But what a gift, what a gift my mother gave to me. What a gift my family gave in, in terms of understanding this is who you are. Remember who you are. Remember the Alamo was that word of saying, remember that you're part of a family. You have an identity. That's what Isaiah is saying to the people in exile. You have an identity. You belong to God. 
You're a child of God. You know, we say that in the Christian faith. We say that through bap baptism, that when you're baptized into the Christian faith, that through the waters of baptism, that, that outward and visible sign uh, of an inward and spiritual grace and truth, that you are a beloved child of God. God has marked you or sealed you with this act of, of water to claim your life. You are a child of God. That's who you are. When you're in exile, when you, you're in the midst of that disruption and disorientation, one of the easiest things to do is to forget who you are and lose your way. And so to hear here in Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah is saying, God is saying through Isaiah, to those whose lives have been disrupted and disoriented, remember who you are. You are mine. You are mine. And I've got you. I haven't forgotten about you. I haven't left you. You're mine. I've claimed you. I've called you by name. Isn't that amazing to think God knows your name? God calls you by name, that you belong to God. We're told then through the prophet something about God's character. And people in exile need to hear this, that God is faithful, that God will not abandon you just because your life is disoriented and you feel distant from God and you feel like God is, is not there, Isaiah is saying, remember this, God is with you. God is with you. And so he says here in verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. I am the Lord your God. Fear not. I am with you. I am with you. Don't be afraid. I'm here. That's some of the most important words in the Bible. And that, that theme of God's steadfast love and presence is throughout the scriptures. A lot of people think, well, the God of the Old Testament is a mean, wrathful God. And the God of the New Testament is a warm and loving God. And, and really, there's a consistency with God. Our understandings evolve and change over time, but, but there's a consistency about who God is in the scriptures. And, and, and the main thing I would say to you about what, what does the Old Testament teach us about God, it is that God is faithful. God will not abandon you. God is faithful. God is with you. That's the message of the Old Testament, God's faithfulness. It, there's a Hebrew word, and I can't say it right, but if you, if you have to kind of get deep in your guttural uh, throat and say chesed, chesed, it, it is H-E-S-E-D, uh, -E -E but it's chesed, and it's about, that's about God's steadfastness or stickiness, that God is so sticky that God, you can't shake God. God's not going to let you go. That God is a God whose love is steadfast, that God is loyal and faithful. It goes back to that idea of covenant. God has made you a covenant with you to be your God, and God will not let you go. And I don't know about you, but when you're in the midst of exile, when you're disoriented by life, sometimes we just need to know that we're not alone, that we know that God is with us. If you believe that today, if you believe that and put that in your heart and, and really make that a part of who you are, that that's your faith in God, that God is steadfast, God is sticky, God will not let you go. It will change your life and it will change everything about how you see life to understand that God is with you. It will change your prayer life. I used to pray and say, um, God, I hope you'll be with Joe as Joe goes through surgery. Or God, I hope, hope you'll be with, with Mary as Mary goes through this difficult circumstance. You know, I quit praying like that because it, it really hit me how that prayer was wrong for me. 
is I understand that God is already there. God is already with us. God hasn't gone anywhere. God has promised to be faithful. So my prayer changed to, God, I know that you're with Joe. I know that you're with Mary. Help them to experience your healing presence. Help them to know that you are here with them because I believe you already are there with them. That changes your prayer life and it changes your attitude about what you're going through and when you're going through it, how God is with you in the midst of, of what you're going through. You're not alone in this. You have a God who is with you. I will not leave you, Jesus said. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you orphaned. Remember, I am with you always to the close of the age. Those were Jesus' words. Jesus continued that same theme about God's ever-present being, that God is with us always, no matter what we go through. The last thing for the, for the exiles, for people in exile, is this word of hope. It's a word that God is going to take you from where you are that God is going to bring you home. God is going to bring you home. Now think about those exiles that are there and days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months and months turn into years and years turn into decades and they are wondering, will we ever go home again? Will we ever, will things ever be the same? And no, things will probably never be the same. But things will be good again. Because God is going to lead them home. God is going to lead them to a place of healing. God is going to lead them to a place that is a good, a good place. Because God's going to be a part of their lives forever. And so God gives them hope. And, and in verse 19 of this same chapter, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, in the rivers of the desert. God is going to make a way when it feels like there is no way. That's God's promise. And how many of us have come up against situations in our lives when we wonder, how in the world are we ever going to get through this time of disruption and disorientation only to find that God was there all along leading us through that time to a new normal, to a new place of hope and wholeness. And that's God's promise that, that God is, is with you. God has called you by name. God is with you and for you. You're not alone in this. And that God is leading you to a new place wonder what would happen in our lives if we really took that seriously, if we really took that to heart and believed that with everything in our being, that God is our God and God will not let you go, that God has you no matter what happens in your life. God holds you. You belong to God. I wonder if that might make a difference when you're going through those difficult times, when you go through those seasons of exile, to know that you're not alone in that, that God has called you by name, and God is with you in this, and God's going to hold you and lead you to a new place of wholeness and well-being. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the greatest story. We, we thank you for the way that this story speaks to us from years ago and how the truth of this story is still our truth today. So many of us have found ourselves, oh God, exiled in one way or another. So many of us feel lost at times, looking for home. Remind us who we are. We belong to you. Remind us, oh God, that we're not alone, that you indeed are with us. And remind us that there's hope 
because you are doing a new thing. You will make a way where there seems like there is no way and you will lead us forward. We trust in you, O oh God. We thank you for your presence with us now and always and forevermore. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. There's someone here today who would unite with our church family by your profession of faith in Christ or by your transfer of membership to our church from another. Our doors are open to you. We'd love to have you as a part of our church family. Two ways to do that. One is to be received here at the chancel rail. During the closing hymn, we'd invite you forward. Or you can go to our joining room, which is right down the north hallway. One of our pastors will be there right after worship today in the joining room to receive you and welcome you into our church family. Let's stand as we sing our praise to God. Thank you for being here today. That hymn has one of my favorite lines in it. In every change, God faithful will remain. That's the truth about God's steadfast love, that God is with us. We're not alone. God knows your name. God has called you by name, and you belong to God. And you're a child of God, loved by God now and always. And God will be with you wherever you go. And God is leading you out of disorientation to orientation to a new and wonderful place where God is there. So let's go forward and share that good news. There's someone you know who needs to know that there's hope in their lives as they're going through a season of disorientation. And maybe God has chosen you to be that prophet, that one who speaks that word of hope into their existence. Let's go into the world and share the good news of God's love for all through Jesus Christ. Amen.